Uh, thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 15678 in the name of Liz Smith on the centenary of the death of Sir Hugh Monroe. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Liz Smith to open the debate. Ms Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And it gives me uh, very great pleasure to present this motion to Parliament this evening. And may I extend a very warm welcome to the members of the Monroe Society who are in the gallery <laughs> and uh, also congratulate them on the outstanding archive exhibition that they have mounted in the AK Bell Library in Perth, which I had the great pleasure to visit uh, just on Friday, uh, which accompanies the exhibition in Kiramuir about Sir Hugh Monroe's life. And can I thank all the representatives of the other groups on whom we depend so much for the preservation of our mountain scenery across Scotland and also welcome a very special climber who is also in the gallery whose name very fittingly is Hugh William Munro who is hoping to uh, complete in a few months time and so may I wish him uh, well in that. I think Deputy Presiding Officer I was 14 when I was first told about Sir Hugh and at the time I'm not sure I paid terribly much attention to either him or to his mountains although I still have an exceptionally vivid memory of walking the Lara Gru and seeing the great towering cliffs of Ben McDewey and Bray Reik above it, which perhaps subliminally at the time inspired me, and I'll say more about that inspiration in just a minute. Sir Hugh was born in London in 1856. He was schooled in Creef, Winchester and Cambridge, but it was his early life around the family estate near Kiramuir with the scenic backdrop of the Angus Glens, and then specifically a trip to Stuttgart to learn German which he combined with a trip through the Alps that sparked Monroe's lifelong love of mountains. He spent some time in South Africa working as private secretary to the governor of Natal before returning to Angus to manage the family estate. And then later in life, Sir Hugh worked as the King's messenger traveling to Asia, North Africa and, and Africa itself. What members might not know is that Sir Hugh had a keen interest in politics standing in 1885 as the Conservative and Unionist candidate in the Kirkcaldy Borough's constituency. Not, it has to be said, with terribly much success, <laughs> polling precisely three votes for every Monroe that he was later to identify. It was in 1891, in the sixth issue of the Journal of the Scottish Mountaineering Club, of which he was a founder member, that Monroe published his original list of all the peaks in Scotland with a height of over 3,000 feet. The original list, the outcome of much painstaking research, was drawn up from the Ordnance Survey maps of the time, as well as from Sir Hugh's own vast knowledge gained from his trips to the hills. At the time, it contained 283 mountains, something that came as more than a little bit of a surprise to many within the Scottish mountaineering community, who believed that the Scottish tops over 3,000 feet were probably only around 30, albeit that the definition of a separate mountain is much clearer today than it was in his time. Of course, the list has undergone several revisions since. Infuriatingly, for some of us who were baggers when we found out that an additional Monroe had suddenly appeared, or one that we had already climbed had disappeared. As things stand at present, there are 282. Sadly, Sir Hugh never quite managed to complete his own list. Three summits eluded him. These were the inaccessible pinnacle on Skye, and I certainly do not blame him for that, given my own experience on that iconic rock. Carna Fiddler, which is a long trail out into the wilds from Lynna Dee or Glen Feshi or Glen Tilt, and Carn Cloyk Vullen in Upper Dee side, which at the same time he believed to be separate Monroe from Ben Broughton. However, as well as his life, Sir Hugh's legacy is the one that we must be celebrating this week. We should celebrate his contribution not only to our mountains, but to Scotland generally, giving the enormous popularity of Monroe bagging, both within the UK and abroad. He can have had little idea of the influence that he was to exert on later generations of walkers and climbers. He would never have expected that his own name would become synonymous with these mountains, nor indeed could he have foreseen the vast numbers of climbers who over a century later would be using his tables as the basis for his leisure activities. He could certainly never have predicted all the books that had been written the tourist trails that have been set up, and the mythology that now surrounds all our Monroes. The first recorded completionist is believed to be the Reverend A.E. Robertson, who became the first person to climb all the Monroes in 1901. But now a quite remarkable list exists. Steve Fallon from Edinburgh holds the record for having completed 15 rounds of all 282 Monroes, 
whilst Hazel Strachan from Bathgate holds the female record with 10 rounds. The record for the fastest round of the Monroes is held by Stephen Pike of Staffordshire, who, without using any motorised transport, completed the round in precisely 39 days and 9 hours. Deputy Presiding Officer, I experienced my own conversion to outdoor education in my early teaching years, and I learnt almost all I know about mountain craft from Ian Murray, who was a senior colleague but also a Monroeist. And it was during those early teaching days that I spent numerous school projects at Loch Ossian, for which I have an enduring affection. Along with groups of pupils and colleagues, I made regular ascents of the 12 accessible Monroes around Loch Ossian, but it was not until the later stages of school projects that the Monroe bug really captured me, completing my own round in 2012. Over the years, that bug has taken me to some of the most wonderful places in Scotland, where I have met some most extraordinary people, where I've tested my own abilities, both athletic and mental, against all the challenges that the elements could throw at me. I've also had the privilege of good companionship, including two of my colleagues, Murdo Fraser and Miles Briggs, who will, I hope, in the not too distant future, also be completists, pretending that their map reading is a bit better <laughs> as we progress. <laughs> but may I finish this tribute to Sir Hugh by offering some thoughts on what I think there are three very important messages that we must take forward. Firstly, that we must be doing all we can to pass on his great legacy to the young people of today, a generation for whom it is so tempting and far too easy to stay indoors and ignore the great beauty of Scotland. We owe them our knowledge and our wisdom when it comes to getting the best of the great outdoors. Secondly, climbing, climbing Monroes brings great enjoyment, but it also brings a great responsibility. Responsibility for ourselves as we embark on challenging adventures in the wilds of Scotland in weather conditions that can really test our judgment at any moment, but also for other people as we guard their safety on the hills. But the third message is to respect and assist all those who preserve and enhance their use great legacy in caring for the environment, whether they build and repair the paths, those who look after the mountain bothies, the moors, those who rescue those who get into difficulty, and all those who support them. We owe them a huge debt of gratitude because without them, we could not enjoy the Monroes in a way that we do. I will finish with some words from the great climber, Edward Wimper who with his ascent of the Matterhorn inspired Monroe. And he said, climb if you will, but remember that courage and strength are not without prudence and that a momentary negligence may destroy the happiness of a lifetime. Wise words, Deputy Presiding Officer, as we remember the legacy of Sir Hugh Monroe. Thank you very much. And uh, just say to the gentleman in the gallery, we don't permit applause from the gallery, much though you wish to do it. Um, I now open debate, Emma Harper, followed by Murdo Fraser. I'm looking forward to Mr. Fraser's tales of going up Monroe's now. Uh, Emma Harper, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I'd like to, first of all, thank Liz Smith for securing this debate and join her and the rest of the country in celebrating the life and legacy of Sir Hugh Monroe the first person to compile a definitive list of Scotland's mountains 3,000 feet high or higher. So, and as Liz Smith has wonderfully expressed in her speech, Sir Hugh himself was unable to complete them all, sadly passing away before bagging the final three, three on his list. But his legacy does live on, encouraging thousands of people each year to hike Scotland's highest mountains with the goal of one day bagging them all. But the legacy of Sir Hugh Munro is not just to encourage people to hike Scotland's Munros, it's to enjoy all types of hills and mountains in Scotland. And while, while my South Scotland region isn't home to a single Munro, not even a single yin, we have plenty of Corbett's and Donald's to make up for it. And my staff member, Ross Cunningham, assures me that hiking Munros and the Donald's with his dug decks is actually so enjoyable and rewarding. The Scottish Mountaineering Club describes the Donald as a Scottish lowlands mountain, which at its highest is 2,000 feet or higher. There are 89 Donalds, most of which are in Dumfries and Galloway, and the greatest of them all is the Merrick, the highest mountain in the south of Scotland. There are, of course, other beautiful mountains and hills in the southwest, such as White Coombe near Moffat, which is on its lower slopes. It's the home of the beautiful Loch Skeen and Greymere's Tail, one of Scotland's and the UK's finest waterfalls. 
The views from the summit of the Merrick are breathtaking, offering panoramic views across the Galloway Forest and hills, and on a clear day, as far afield as the Isle of Man and Northern Ireland. I've been passionate about promoting the South West and bringing more tourists to the region because we really do have so much to offer visitors, particularly the region's role in the life of one of Scotland's greatest icons, Robert the Bruce. And so I'd encourage any hill walkers planning to hike the Merrick to take in Bruce's stone at the foot of the mountain. It's a massive granite boulder with inscriptions which commemorates Bruce's first victory in 1307 during the Scottish Wars of Independence. Someone who has walked the summit of the Merrick on many occasions is a Weil Kent friend of Galloway, Steve Norris. Steve's an author and journalist for Galloway and a keen hill walker. Perhaps Steve Norris is our Southwest equivalent to Sir Hugh Munro. Born and bred in Wigtonshire, he's been climbing the Galloway Hills since he was a wee boy. And Steve wrote a series of articles on exploring the mountains in the Southwest called To the High Country. The series prompted many requests from readers to write books about his adventures in the hills, which he now has begun three books. He describes Galloway Hills as a magical kingdom. The Cairnsmore Range and the Minigaff Range published and three more in the pipeline. And I think it's good that Steve is inspiring people to explore and bag Bonnie Galloway and its upland hills, and I'm sure further afield to bag the Munros. And I follow his hikes and his uh, photos on his Facebook page with his Doug Grury and his page is Galloway Hills Books. And finally, presiding officer, I'd like to say a thank you to Scotland's mountain rescue teams. And I'm aware many have been called out recently and been kept very busy. In the southwest, we have the Galloway Mountain Rescue Team, a charity in Newton Stewart, providing rescue services in the Dumfries and Galloway and South Ayrshire area. They were formed in 1975 and have responded to over 420 incidents, including one as recently as last weekend. Like other mountain rescue teams, Galloway MRT is a charity run by volunteers who give up their own time when called upon, which can put their life in danger to rescue those who are injured or in distress in our mountains and hills. I would encourage everyone to visit their website to learn more about their work and to read about how to keep safe in the hills, whether you're bagging the Galloway Hills or the Monroes. So in this centenary of the death of Sir Hugh Munro, whether you're climbing the Monroes named after him or the Donald's Dune in Bonnie Galloway, our Scotland is the most beautiful country to explore. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Ms Harper. Call Murdo Fraser. Mr Fraser, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by congratulating my colleague Liz Smith on securing this debate and for her motion, which I was very pleased to uh, support. Uh, there cannot be many individuals who have a whole sport or activity named after them, but Sir Hugh Munro falls into that category. The pastime of Munro bagging, which now attracts many thousands of people uh, to Scotland and many thousands of Scots into the hills every weekend and at holiday time, is a direct result of his efforts in compiling a list of Scottish peaks over 3,000 feet. As Liz Smith set out earlier in the, this debate, Sir Hugh was a native of Angus, growing up on his family estate of Lindertus near Kirimuir. I had the privilege of attending a few years ago an unveiling of a memorial stone to him in the centre of Kirimuir, where he is being, was being remembered as one of the town's greatest sons. I have not yet had the opportunity to visit the Monroe Society exhibition at the AKL Bale Library in Perth, but it's very much on my list of things to do in the coming days. Sir Hugh never managed to complete the round of Monroe's himself, being driven off sky by bad weather on more than one occasion, so he never made it to the top of the inaccessible pinnacle. In that respect, at least I have one up on him, a Deputy Presiding Officer, <laughs> having completed all the peaks on the Coolan Ridge a few years ago. It was certainly an unforgettable experience and one far away from the perception many have of Scottish hill walking just being about trudging over boggy moors infested by vicious midges. <laughs> Although there is a fair bit of the experience <coughs> that is about that too. Unlike Liz Smith, I have not yet completed the round of Monroe's. I think on my last count I was on 193, so now I have fewer than 100 to go and I'm hoping to get there one day. Uh, last summer, I was able to take my son, who was then aged 10, up his very first Munro, which is Ben Hope, in the north of Scotland. Uh, I'm not sure that experience inspired him to try and climb many others. He did ask me what, he th what exactly was the point of the exercise uh, when he got to the top, but I'm hoping one day he will be inspired by the, the bug that has bitten so many uh, other climbers. 
What Monroe's tables do is set out a list of peaks to climb in a number, which is a substantial effort, which may, most people will complete over an extended period of time, perhaps a lifetime. But for those who do, there isn't just a sense of great achievement. What they will have done is experience Scotland in comprehensive fashion, seeing all different parts of the country, from the Angus Glens and the Cairngorms in the east to the wild northwest, and experience, no doubt, the extremes of weather, and on occasion push themselves beyond the limits of what they think they could accomplish. I know there are some climbers who get rather snooty about Monroe bagging, but it is a popular and challenging way to experience Scottish hills, and many who start climbing the Monroes have gone on to greater exploits elsewhere. And we should not forget, Deputy Presiding Officer, the tremendous contribution that the sport of climbing Monroes makes to the Scottish tourist economy. There are now thousands of people on the Monroe Trail, something that is evident by the well-trodden paths that lead to the top of even the most remote peaks. And the whole industry of providing hotel beds, self-catering, meals, drinks, and outdoor shops has been built around the existence of Monroe's table. And finally, climbing Monroe's is about fresh air and exercise, a relatively inexpensive hobby, helping people get fit, and something we all need to be doing more of. So in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm very pleased to support this motion. And I would encourage those who have not yet had the experience of climbing Monroe's to get out there and do it. And I'm sure we'll all be celebrating Sir Hugh Monroe's legacy for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Jenny Mara to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Ms Mara, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I also thank, uh, thank and congratulate Liz Smith on um, tabling um, this great motion and securing this very enjoyable uh, debate. Can I also congratulate her on being a Monroeist? I really take uh, my hat off to her and also to Murdo Fraser's impressive total of 193. I have to say mine is slightly less than 50, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, but there's no less joy in that. And it's something, um, I don't know if I'll ever complete them all, but it's certainly uh, one of the most enjoyable pastimes and something that I have enjoyed since um, being a young teenager. It's a particular um, honour for me to speak in this debate because, of course, I, I'm a member for the North East and represent uh, the area of Curry Muir, which was Sir Hugh Monroe's birthplace, and hope to manage to visit the exhibition uh, before it closes, I believe, later this year. I was interested to hear also uh, Liz Smith mention Steve Fallon. Uh, Steve Fallon's Twitter feed gives me um, a lot of encouragement on a, a dark morning on my way into this parliament, knowing that I won't make it out again during daylight because some of the pictures that he tweets from the beautiful light um, and some of the gorgeous scenes across our country. Um, on a, I wish he would do it even more regularly, actually, on my Twitter feed because it, it gladdens my heart uh, every time I see them. I wanted to speak in this debate, presiding officer, um, I've spoken here before on the importance of access to the outdoors and indeed Liz Smith and I both spoke in a debate on uh, the importance of outdoor education uh, just a few weeks ago. But I feel particularly um, passionate about this because we do know that there are so many children still in Scotland today who are brought up in cities who have never even been to a beach, uh, let alone a mountain. And I think some of the organisations that are doing work uh, across Scotland to encourage this um, deserve um, to be marked today and deserve our thanks and praise. And I would like to mention Duke of Edinburgh in that Duke of Edinburgh has, I think traditionally, and uh, when I was younger, I'm not a Duke of Edinburgh participant, I, it was never available um, when I was at school. But what they are doing now is making a concerted effort to go into communities and um, that, that perhaps don't have as much access and the resources to, to fund and facilitate uh, access to the outdoors. And so I'd like to mark our thanks to them and hope that the whole parliament can give encouragement to them as they go forward with, um, with that project. Um, can I also take the opportunity to echo uh, Emma Harper's thanks to our mountain rescue. We saw just last week how important uh, that service is. And also Liz Smith's thanks to all those organisations across the Scotland that maintain the pathways and the infrastructure that we need. I also think Murdo 
Fraser's point about the impact of the economy. Um, I don't quite have the words to, uh, to articulate this, but of course there are people who are a bit snooty about the Monroe's bagging project. Um, but I think Murdo Fraser is right to point out that human Monroe really made it a thing and once something becomes um, a, a goal to achieve, then it becomes an accessible challenge for people. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that if it's about encouraging people into the outdoors. Presiding officer, let me finish by drawing the Parliament's attention to a project um, in memory of Sir Hugh Monroe that's just, that is being launched next week, I believe, by the University of Dundee, and it's called the Monroe Table Project. And they are asking members of the public, experienced mountaineers or people who have never done uh, climbed a mountain before, to sign up to uh, climb one Munro uh, by the end of this year, and also to remove a small bag of rubbish uh, as they as they walk. It sounds like a good project. It's an environmental project, and I hope anyone who's listened to this debate might go and explore it further. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Andy Whiteman, last speaker in the open debate. Mr Whiteman, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I thank Liz Smith for bringing this debate. Um, uh, she is probably the first Monroe County Police District MSP. I don't know if there have been any uh, before. Um, this is also my second members' debate on two topics I'm interested. Who owns the Monroes yesterday and the Monroes themselves uh, today? Uh, my diary indicated that it was meant to be a Faculty of Actuaries event this evening, uh, but I had a meeting earlier with Murdo Fraser and he's offering me a place in his taxi, so don't run away so we can get to that on time. Um, as a new member of the Parliament, I'm not sure who among our number shares this obsession, <laughs> and if nothing else, coming to this debate reveals uh, some of them. I should add that I am not a Monroe uh, bagger as such, although I've probably climbed more than 200 of them. But as a teenager, I'd been a member of the Oakles Mountaineering Club, and members there were starting to complete. In fact, I climbed regularly with someone who I think who was a 99th uh, a completer. But I decided at university in, in Aberdeen to stop counting because this was a cool thing to do. I was in the Larrig Club, which is the University Mountaineering Club. I was president, in fact. Um, and there was another club called the Exploration Society, and we regarded them as uh, pond life. They, they just went and walked, uh, and they also went up Monroe's. Um, so it was cool, therefore, to distinguish yourself by not being a Monroe bagger, because if you're a Monroe bagger, you are meant to be in the Exploration Society. Nevertheless, I continue to enjoy, uh, in winter and summer, uh, wandering up hills uh, by less strenuous uh, routes, some very strenuous routes, um, and was kind, content to keep uh, climbing uh, them. Uh, but by this time, it had become too late to achieve a goal I would have quite liked to set myself, and that was, uh, I think that was uh, uh, in uh, Bob Scott's Bothy in the Cairn Gorms, I committed myself to being the first person not to complete the Monroes. Now, of course, all bar 6,000 people have, in fact, achieved this, including, I imagine, many people here. In fact, everyone bar Liz Smith. Um, but my goal was to be the first to actually climb them, but stop 10 foot short of the summit. Um, <laughs> which was a rather bizarre goal, but I, 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 can't, I can't achieve that now. But in recent years, uh, my family members have been quite enthusiastic. I got my Monroe's tables out, uh, and I saw all the pencil ticks and dates which petered out uh, in the 1980s. And as members have said over the past 20 years, the outdoors have become much, much more popular, and this, of course, is extremely welcome. And particularly, I was uh, climbing Ben Kluch, actually, not Monroe, but Nice Hill, um, a few weeks ago, and I was quite um, surprised, in fact, and delighted to see so many young women um, out walking uh, on the hills because when I started going the hills, Liz Smith probably uh, shares this, it was very much a male pursuit um, and indeed too many men I think went out of their way to discourage women and also uh, young people. Now I find the, the uh, modern obsessions around Monroe's a bit baffling but also quite fascinating and I was delighted to read a recent blog on the Fiona Outdoors website by Monroe bagger Anne Butler. This is based on an article she wrote for the Monroe Society Journal in 2016. I didn't even know there was a Monroe Society, but there you go. I apologise for my ignorance. In September 2018, Anne became the first full house finisher. A full house being the completion of not only the Monroes, but the Monroe Tops, the Corbett's, the Graham's, the Donald's and the Firth's. Uh, whatever they are. And she's now planning to complete another full house as well as her sixth and seventh round of the Monroes. And her article was entitled There Are No Rules and she asked some thorny questions about Monroes that have to be reclassified and whether you need to go back up a Monroe that's been elevated to that status. She also drew her attention to, of course, to the first person to have completed the Monroes without a beard um, was uh, a J. Dow uh, in 1933. And she also has a very interesting section on how do you count yours, an age-old problem, she says, 
um, that many would welcome a ruling on is between the ongoing debate between golfers and bankers. So the purists, or golfers as they're known, believe that you don't start a second or subsequent round till you've finished the last. And then there's the bankers who apply the cumulative mode of counting and simply start the next round on whatever total of repeat ascents that have already been achieved. And you can see how this kind of gentle obsession uh, can occupy people in many, many hours of entertaining conversation, uh, which is perfectly uh, delightful. Uh, so to conclude, uh, presiding officer, Scotland is probably blessed to have had human rows in his famous tables that's given a generation of folk a very demanding target for what otherwise might be uh, a less demanding uh, pastime. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, from university was Andy Nisbet, who tragically died a few weeks ago, and he's a good example of people he completed as Munro's by the time he was 19, but his kind of wide experience of the hills developed an interest, a skill, and a talent to go on to be arguably Scotland's most prolific and successful winter climber with more than a thousand new routes across the country. So may folk from Scotland, the UK, and across the world continue to enjoy all our hills have to offer. Much of that will be found on Munro's, but a good deal will not be. Thank you. And I call the Mary Goujon to close the government. Minister, please. Uh, thank you, President, Presiding Officer. I'm absolutely del delighted to be here and to have the opportunity to, to close the debate tonight, uh, celebrating the life of Sir Hugh Monroe, because I think it's been like, one of the one of the best natured debates that, that I've sat in on in the past week while actually and I really want to thank Liz Smith for bringing forward this motion and for allowing us the opportunity to celebrate the life of Sir Hugh Monroe and everything that he achieved and the lasting legacy that he's left in Scotland and as I say I'm excited to do that tonight but particularly because of the Angus connection I don't quite represent uh, Kerry Muir that's in Angus South. Kerry Muir is home to quite a few famous sons between Hugh Monroe, Bon Scott and J.M. Barriott's Angus is, is quite, the, quite the home for talent. And I also want to welcome the visitors that we'll have in the gallery tonight as well. That's so really disappointed to hear about Willie Monroe not quite completing it yet though. So look forward to hearing about when he's completed that, that challenge. And I want to thank Liz for, for all the background that Liz Smith, for the background that she provided in the history on that tonight. And I didn't realize that Sir Hugh Monroe had been a conservative candidate for, and stood for the election as well. And I was like, there's jokes in there about Tories and elections, but I, I won't go there tonight. It's been relatively good natured, so I'll, I'll leave that one well alone. But um, again, I, I was really looking forward to this because our Monroes, our hills and wider landscape are something that I'm really passionate about. And my constituency of Angus, North and Mearns is actually home to Scotland's most easterly Monroe in Mount Keen which I go to often and where if you visit it from the Glenesque side, you pass the Queen's Well, which is a crown shaped structure built in granite to commemorate the site where Queen Victoria passed by on an outing from Balmoral. Um, but I, I would like to think I have ambitions to be a Monroe bagger, though in saying that it does seem quite competitive in terms of the, the numbers of Monroes that people have, have scaled tonight. Um, I think from Murdo's 193, Liz Smith has completed them all. Jenny Mara around 50. Andy Whiteman could have done 200, could have done them all. He's too cool to count, so who really knows? Um, so it makes my paltry eight sound a little bit pathetic. But saying that, I have done some of them a lot more than once. Um, but I think that I really have had some of the most special and memorable moments of my life I, I have been those days when I've been up climbing the hills and especially when you do it on your own though I'm something of a, of, of a springtime walker I only do, really do it in the in the good weather and that's really when you can see the whole of Scotland laid out before you and I think yeah it really does make your heart swell uh, when you see just what a fantastic and incredible landscape you live in uh, and in terms of some of the the me most memorable moments in my life I think one of them was when I was up climbing Mayor and Dreesh the snow came down, I lost my car key at the top and only discovered that at the bottom. Sorry, it was my mum's car key because I'd borrowed her car. Had to go up with a metal detector two days later to get a phone call at the top from the ranger base at the bottom. Somebody had sat down next to it that day and found it and brought it back down. So that was a bit of good luck. Um, but enough about my personal attachment to it because I think it's important that we take a moment to reflect on how far we've come in Scotland since devolution because one of this parliament's early successes was the, the National Parks Act in 2000 and our two national parks Loch Lomond and the Trossachs and the Cairngorms are thriving areas which really showcase some of the best of natural Scotland and the Cairngorms of course has some of the highest Monroes in Scotland too. Uh, if you take a, a walk up through Baloch Bui Forest to Loch Nagar or up to the west side of the grew to Cairn Tool and by the side of Loch Lomond is the most southerly and most one of the most often climbed Monroes in Ben Lomond which now commemorates those that died in the war at the Ben Lomond National Memorial
natural landscape. And it's probably quite a poignant reflection that Sir Human Rowe himself just lived to see the end of the First World War. And no doubt that he would have seen the Ben Lomond National Memorial landscape as a fitting tribute to the death and suffering of so many at that time, having served with the Red Cross himself. Um, now, in 2003 came the Land Reform Scotland Act, and I have no reservations in saying that probably all of our Monroe baggers must be grateful for that groundbreaking legislation, which brought Scotland's access rights into the 21st century. And the access rights our climbers and walkers now benefit from are world leading in terms of the extent, scope, and the clarity of them. The Scottish Outdoor Access Code leaves a legacy of inclusion, of which I would like to think that Human Row would be justly proud. And our core path plans also also provide for access closer to where people live. Now, later in 2006, in the Planning Act, the, that secured our best landscapes as the suite of national scenic areas, and they're secured special protection within the planning system to ensure that they will always remain attractive to our global visitor markets. Now, even those who don't go on to become full-blown mountaineers can get huge physical and mental health benefits from getting outdoors and challenging themselves, including by walking our Monroes. And as Emma Harper highlighted, it's not just about the Monroes, but getting out and about in general and enjoying our scenery right across Scotland, whether that's uh, including the Corbett's and the Donald's too. So the Scottish Government has a vision of a Scotland where more people are more active and active more often. And physical activity, of course, is about getting people moving and walking in Scotland's natural environment is free. And we know that being active outdoors is good for both physical and mental health. And Emma Harper also mentioned Ross Cunningham in her office, who has talked about this recently and I believe he's done pieces with the, with the BBC about that. In 2017, the Scottish Household Survey showed that recreational walking has consistently been the most common type of physical activity which adults participate in. And that's risen from 57% in 2011 to 70% in 2017. And we're working with partners to promote green exercise, support local green health partnerships, and maximize investment in green, infra in, in green infrastructure. Playing, learning and having fun outdoors helps to improve well-being and resilience. It's associated with a wide range of health benefits in children and really allows children to use the natural world to help develop the curiosity and science skills. And there's a growing body of research also shows a, a positive impact on educational, atta educational attainment as part of that too. And the right to play outdoors every day has been enshrined in the Scottish Government's national health and social care standards. And we are a signatory to Scotland's Outdoor Play and Learning Coalition position statement and I think that Liz Smith was absolutely right when she talked about the three, three great lessons that, that we should heed uh, towards the end of her speech and the first of those being to pass on Sir Hugh Monroe's legacy to our young people and encourage that spirit of adventure and uh, to Murdo Fraser I mean I wouldn't worry too much that your son may have not picked up the bug yet uh, or get the Monroe bug this is from somebody who feigned illness to get out of their bronze Duke of Edinburgh and it's only a bug that hit me later on in life uh, in which I'm very much hooked on and addicted to now and that takes me on to Jenny Mara's point and the absolutely the vital point she made about the work of Duke of Edinburgh and what they're trying to do with our with our young people and uh, also about the environmental project that she talked about that's happening in Dundee at the moment and I think that's a challenge that we should probably set to people right across this chamber as well and uh, hopefully one Monroe by the end of the year shouldn't be, shouldn't be too much for for anybody to to manage or to try and do. Now, we also heard about the massive impact on tourism uh, and Visit Scotland's visitor surveys show that about 50% of respondents cited Scotland's scenery and landscape as their top reason for, for visiting. Uh, this is the number one reason for visiting Scotland in all markets, whether that's in people who are resident in Scotland from the rest of the UK, European visitors and long haul visitors too. Nature based tourism, including activities based on Scotland's landscapes and wildlife, makes a substantial contribution to the tourism sector. And and tourist spending on nature-based activities is worth nearly 40% of all tourism spending. And its value to Scotland's economy is £1.4 billion per year, and it supports 39,000 uh, jobs. Now, just to wrap that up, I would say that Scotland's natural environment is, of course, a huge asset, and our Monroes are a key part of that. And that's, again, why I want to thank Liz Smith so much for bringing this forward to the Chamber tonight, so that we get the chance to celebrate and remember Sir Hugh Monroe, who unknowingly at that time created one of the great challenges to hill walkers in Scotland, across the UK, and internationally. And I would simply encourage people in this Chamber and out with it to get outside, get out, explore, and enjoy Sir Human Rose, a fantastic legacy to Scotland. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, that concludes a very entertaining debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament.